Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. Happy Monday morning, Hokie Nation. Basketball season has come to a close, and it's the end of an era for Virginia Tech women's basketball. We got everybody on set today to unpack it all. It's episode 356 of the Tech Sideline podcast, and it starts right now. Welcome back in once again, Hokies fans. We record on Monday, March 25th, 2024, from our studio in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Remember to like, subscribe, and refer the show to a friend, and head over to techsideline.com to check out our extensive editorial content. As always, the first month of subscriptions is free. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. To my right, lead analyst and columnist under the red shirt sign, as always, Mr. Chris Coleman. Across the way, our managing editor, David Cunningham. In the fourth chair, senior staff writer, Andy Bitter. And producing behind the scenes, our wrestling insider who had a busy weekend himself, Mr. Jack Briz and Dime. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. Today, we also welcome a brand new sponsor, the Master of Agricultural and Applied Economics degree at Virginia Tech. The Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at Virginia Tech is a premier world-class department ranked globally in the top 10%. Visit online-ms.aaec.vt.edu today to learn how you can accelerate your career with our 100% online Masters of Agricultural and Applied Economics degree. If you can say all that, you can get any job. Yeah. It's funny. Tongue twisted. They, they, they teach us in, in class for doing this whole sports casting thing, Bill Ross classes, they teach us how to write not like that. Um, so so it's funny that that ends up being an ad read. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> definitely go check it out. Uh, <laughs> so who wrote that? Will Stewart need to attend Bill Roth's class? No, I, I don't know who wrote it. I don't know. Uh, Will actually touched it up. So it was it was once longer and wordier, uh, believe it or not. Uh, nevertheless, gentlemen, end of an era for Virginia Tech women's basketball. Kind of an emotional night last night inside Castle Coliseum. The Hokies fall in really a terrific college basketball game at the hands of Baylor, 75. 572 the final score so much uncertainty going forward we're going to get into the kenny brooks conversation everything like that uh, but first let's talk win over uh, marshall on friday and then break down this baylor game as well uh, uh, marshall on friday i thought tech played really good basketball um but marshall is not baylor baylor's a really good team and i think everybody saw that um you know it was a rock fight is kind of what you expected between an acc team and a big 12 team that you know, are two kind of perennial powers in their own conferences. Uh, and I thought, you know, though he's I've been without Elizabeth Kitley, that was announced on Thursday that she tore her ACL and was out for the year. Um, and that's kind of what we figured. We had said that she, we didn't think she was going to play. Um, and I thought yesterday the Hokies did a really good job of doing everything they could. Like, they fought for 40 minutes. I mean, they, they played – it wasn't – they didn't play great basketball the whole time, but I thought they gave themselves chances to win. And in March, that's what matters. You're in position at the end to have an opportunity. And um, I honestly thought Baylor was just a little bit better. I, I, I wrote about it. I thought Jada Walker, the Baylor guard from Henrico High School in Richmond um, – the very end of the game, she ran off like 11 seconds, dribbling out the clock. And there was one where it was six seconds of her just dribbling the ball around and text trying to wrangle her. And this is a one point game. And it's like, I thought that kind of encapsulated a lot of the game where it's like tech was there, just couldn't necessarily grab hold and really take control. Tech only left for 17 seconds. And <laughs> Baylor is a very good team that doesn't necessarily have a, a star, but has a lot of really good players, relies on its veterans and Walker and Sarah Andrews and, um, you know, last minute heroics from Georgia Amor almost gave the Hokies, you know, a tie ball game, almost sent them to overtime. Um, yeah, just it's really weird that the, the season's done. I told you, Joe, like a month ago today, college game day was in Blacksburg. 
and a month later, like Virginia Tech is no longer playing basketball, men's or women's. And um, but Tech gave it all it had for forty minutes, and um, you know, man, I thought I thought that crowd was the best one of the entire season. It was and, nuts. Uh, just kind of just came up short, and sometimes that happens. And as Kenny Brooks said, you know, better team. You know, Baylor was just a little bit better, and um, you know, I thought Georgia Amor explained it pretty well. We just made too many little mistakes. And, and oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say turnovers, defensive errors. Those are the things that, if you want to advance the Sweet Sixteen, that's what matters. And Bad half court shot defense. Yeah, I mean, like, I, look, man, at the end of the the end of the third quarter, right? George Amor has a wide open layup, misses. Tech, Tech ends up hitting a three. Carly Wenzel in the corner, and and then that ties the game. And then Jada Walker hits a half court shot or just inside half court to to give Baylor a three point lead. And Baylor ended up winning by three. Yeah, like Baylor was just a smidge better. But in in this in you know in the NCAA tournament, that's all matters. Uh, yeah, going back to the Marshall game, I, I think Tech handled that extremely well. We, we thought they would break, do fine breaking their press. I didn't see Tech winning by 40-some points, but uh, Largest they did. margin of victory in NCAA tournament history yeah, for Tech as a program. It was amazing. Um, I, I think parity has improved a lot in women's basketball at the top level amongst the big conferences, but I think you can still see that gulf between the top conference because conferences and the smaller conferences. Because what did Marshall lose one conference game all year? Yeah. Right. So they dominated that league and then the Sunbelt, yeah. Right. And then and then lost to Tech by over forty. Um I, I saw Tech played really well that game. The Baylor game, um, you know, it was a combination of little things. Um I thought the end of the second quarter, when all of Tech's bigs were in foul trouble and they had to play some hill at center, and you could see there was just no post offense. Uh, it was just a perimeter-based offense, and it, that was pretty much. I, I don't remember exactly what the score was when when, when all that foul trouble occurred, but Baylor kind of took control of the last three minutes or so, I would say, of the of the second quarter and took that halftime lead. Um, when Tech wasn't offering much of a threat on offense because they didn't have the lineup. And then uh, in the second half, you know, I thought it was obviously a half-court shot helps. But beyond that, I thought Baylor was really good on, on their inbounds plays. They scored on a layup and then a left-handed jumper. Um, and then, of course, when Tech was going to foul, they threw a terrific inbounds pass and got a layup out of it. And uh, and I thought it should have been intentional. Yeah, I thought it should have been. I, I thought Tech was very fortunate that, that it wasn't called an intentional. Baylor's call. coach thought that too. She, she Emphatically so. <laughs> <during the game. laughs> I had more texts about her last night than I did the actual game. I couldn't believe but, she didn't get teed oh, up. I can't believe Could it. Not like, believe you gotta it. you gotta get that under control if you're an official. But uh, and, and then you know I thought Baylor again inbounding trying to run the clock out the end. They got. <laughs> Their point guard, their quick, shifty point guard, isolated in the backcourt against two of Tech's slower players, and she was able to run off between those two different inbounds passes probably eight or ten seconds. There's you 11. Know, it, yeah. 11, you 11 know what's seconds. interesting is Kenny Brooks said Tech was trying to switch Samuel off, mm -hmm. but it was so loud Samuel couldn't hear. Those darn Tech fans. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's just one of those crazy, like crazy things where it's like – yeah. You know, like tech just just so loud that they can't hear. But yeah, they, I thought you know, Nikki Collin has a WNBA background. She's a very, very, very good basketball IQ mind, X's and O's coach. And like the the curl that Walker ran where she kind of she basically took a couple steps toward half court and then basically sprinted, curled around towards the rim on the one where it probably should have been an intentional foul on Kayla King. Like, just perfectly designed. Yeah. And Baylor executed. And I think it literally came down to execution. Baylor executed better than Virginia Tech did at the end of the day. Yeah. And, the, you know, there was a possession late for Tech where they turned it over. And Georgia Amor didn't touch the ball on that possession. Um, so, like I said, it's a combination of little things. Um, considering what, what, everything we just talked about, it's kind of amazing that Tech only lost by three. 
which shows that I think other parts of the game they executed really well. Matilda Eck had a terrific game. You know, we talk about her not scoring for three straight games and she needed to get going again. She certainly got going in the NCAA tournament. She had two terrific games. Uh, so Tech did a lot of things well, but, you know. Clara it, Strack? Clara Strack, the Strack attack, which Strack Geo, attack. if you hadn't pat- patented that yet, you should go ahead and do it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think she played terrific in, in both games. So, you know, there's a lot of things they did well, but uh, – you know, but Baylor played awfully well. I mean, even, even without Kitley, Virginia Tech, it's a difficult team to beat at home, and Baylor did it. I mean, how, how many games in a row had Tech won at home? 26. 26. Tech had not lost at home since December of 2022. Right. That's Tech's second loss in two years at home. Yeah. I, I remember sitting there at halftime talking with the guys back in the media room saying – Tech at this point is 2 of 16 Mm. from beyond the arc, and you look at the foul trouble. Everybody that plays on the inside, Rose had two, Clara had two, and Olivia Sumiel had two at halftime. And it's like, all things considered, for Tech to be in this game right now, like, you couldn't ask for a better scenario when you look at the box score. I thought Tech was Tech was right there. And then Tech comes out and does a little bit of a third-quarter blitz, as Georgia likes to, and they like to call it. Started it with a three. Right off yeah, the gate. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, to Matilda's credit, she was 0-4 in the first half, comes back with 4-4 in the second half. And Amor got a couple threes down. But I thought there were a couple of defensive lapses that were just, like, uh, in the last 12 minutes of the game, I put this in my story, you know, Tech only allowed, I think, seven or eight offensive boards all game. And when I say that, I mean – you know, I say only because Tech had the same number of offensive boards. But three of those came in the final 12 minutes that Baylor scored on. Right. And it's like, you, I, I thought Tech just struggled to really... Baylor did a really good job of maybe not getting the first shot to go, but a couple different times it got a second or third shot to go. And, like, Baylor... I thought the very last play of the game kind of summed everything up a little bit where you're trying, Tech's trying to inbound, does not have Kayla King, because who is usually the inbounder. She fouled out mm. on the play that Walker dribbled around for you know six seconds. And the plays to go to Eck coming off a you know, curl, catch and shoot for three, and Baylor guarded it so well. And the ball was tipped, and... Ball goes to Amor, and Amor has to, like, heave it over her head because, like, Baylor just mucked it up like that. Um, I thought Baylor's defense was really, really good. They really extended it out past the three-point line and made things difficult. So, yeah, I I thought Baylor played a really good game, so tip your cap. No doubt about it. Well, continuing to kind of take a look at the box score here, one thing I think Baylor did that kind of helped Tech stay in it, too, free throws, they struggled 16 to 25 from the line altogether. I think they were 4 of 10 in the first half, and they were 12 of 21 at one point. But to their credit, uh, their point guard made a Walker down the stretch. hit. What, what was it, yeah. Andy, 9 of 10? 9 of 10. I yeah. think the rest of the team was like, uh, what was it? I had it in the story. It was like six of yeah. – they, they, they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> they were <laughs> not bad. good. The rest of the team. <laughs> not good. She's from Richmond, by the way. Yeah, that's what I said. Henrico. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, somebody asked that question in, in the press conference. She said, I, I wasn't leaving the state of Virginia without, uh, w- without a win. So, um, interesting there, nevertheless. All right, let's talk about the, the, the well, big picture. Oh, Andy's got some more. Well, just big picture yeah, on yeah. this whole thing. I thought it was a worthy exit for this team. I mean, you look back a couple weeks ago um, – you know, they're playing without Kitley for the second time uh, against Notre Dame. They didn't look like they belonged on the court with Notre Dame. I mean, that was a huge loss. I forget what the final margin was, 20-something. 20 27 or 8, I think. Uh, they got blown out in that game. And you're thinking, this team's not getting anywhere near the Sweet 16. At least that's what I was thinking. Uh, and I'm sure I was not alone uh, from people that follow this team thinking that was the case. So I, I thought this was uh, a worthy exit and a team that played – you know, admirably trying to retool on the fly, come up with a whole, you know, you lose the center of your universe for this game uh, for the rest of the season. It's tough to adjust like that. They played uh, very close. You know, I said it was a 15 round fight in my story. I thought they played great up until the end. They just couldn't, they didn't do enough to win it. I think they needed, uh, they needed a great Amor game. I don't think they got that. I think she played okay at times. She didn't really shoot the ball well, especially from deep. 
Uh, David mentioned that layup that she missed. That was just like, man, that was there. I think they would have given the lead at that point. Instead, she misses it. Uh, Michelle gets the her fourth foul directly off of that. I don't think it was a foul necessarily. We were right there in front of it. I don't think it was over the back. Uh, but she got whistled for it. So that was a you know turning point type thing there. Uh, you know, just didn't have enough to get over the, the hump at the end. But I, I don't think that's something that you look at and you hang your head and go, oh man, what what a disappointing. Uh, way for the season to end, but perhaps disappointing, but not just like devastating. Uh, you know, this is a team that did have final four ambitions, but that all changes once Kitley goes down there. So I, I think the way that they finished the season is something you can hold your head up high about. I, I think admirable is the right word. Like, like Andy said, um, tech barely, I mean, tech, tech scraped by Miami and I thought tech played better against Miami in the ACC tournament, but like Andy said, it didn't look like it belonged against Notre Dame. And yeah, I think offensively in the ACC tournament without Kitley, they looked like five individuals out there. But once they got that that long stretch of time off and, you know, he was able to look at that film and talk to his players about it, you could see a much more cohesive offensive plan in the NCAA tournament games. I, I thought what Clara Strack did was immense. I mean, you're talking about somebody who – like like the the players and coaches talked about could have start you know could have started for pretty much for most teams in the country this year and was sitting behind Elizabeth Kitley and you know when she finally gets her chance to shine I mean she had her first career double double last night and a bunch of I thought I thought she had two really really impressive plays she had an offensive rebound that she put back that's the that, that was a, the the one time I think all game where it was kind of in a sea of people, and she just jumped up, grabbed the rebound, and stuck it back up. And then she had one where she went to her left and laid it up and in, and she hadn't done that all game. Like, Clara Strack, she, her development, like, you look back a month ago, she, this, she was not this good of a player. But Kenny Brooks had time to continue to work, and, and to Clara, Clara credited Liz and Georgia and Kayla just especially Liz being a resource you know just to to learn from and um, there was a moment I'm sure people saw on television where Clara came out and went over to Liz directly on the baseline and Liz told her something real quick you know just like um, you know her development has just been crazy and and I, I, I look at that game last night and I think Tech probably needed a little bit more from Amor. And, um, but all things considered, I thought Tech played a pretty good game. And to think that this is a Baylor team that's really, really good, um, obviously playing at home helps. Um, but I, I look at a player like, for example, Karis Baker. She didn't score, but I thought her defensive intensity and her rebounding, she had – a stretch of like back-to-back defensive possessions where she stole the ball, led for a Virginia Tech bucket, and then she comes and gets a jump ball. And she had two rebounds and a block. Like, like Tech needed some big moments and got them. And then it's like, I think it just, you know, kind of just needed one last push. Well, and you mentioned Strack. I mean, she had a couple of those three-point plays Early on, it felt like that was as loud as Castle got it. Yeah, yeah. Two and sure. ones in it the felt first like five minutes. There were like five or six moments in that game where they had a chance to hit a shot that would have blown the roof off that place. Like that place was ready to erupt. And I feel like if they ever hit one of those and it puts Baylor in a position where, oh no, this place is coming down on us the, now. I like, can speak to being in the crowd last night, and there were several of those situations where, like you said, it was about to turn, and the fans in front of you stand up, so you stand up too. You're about to get that defensive stop, and then you're going to put a run on them, and it's going to be game over. So you stand up, you start cheering, and then Baylor makes a shot, and you sit back down. Baylor makes a shot, or Tech misses a shot. I mean, they led for 17 seconds, and it was off of a free throw make. Right. That's not one where it's like, oh my gosh, everybody's into the game. Like, but if if Georgia hits one of those deep threes or something, man, that place would have just exploded Speak- at that point. And that would have been, and that's when it starts the psychological thing. Then the other team is thinking, your your head's swimming, and all of a sudden you're up against, you know, nine thousand people, however many it holds in that place. I and mean, that's where that home adva- home court advantage really could have come into play. And it, they just never quite got to that moment in that game. S- speaking of the Strack attack, how about that three pointer she made? Against Marshall, Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. she thought about it for she a did. good second and a half, and then 
fired it away. Yeah. I, well, I mean, Baylor at the end there, like it relied on its veterans and, and well, like you said, Chris, for Virginia tech, it's like a bunch of different things that tech probably could have like, you do one little thing better and it makes all the difference. But like, um, I, th- I thought at the end of the game, some of tech's veterans made some plays that kind of cost them a little bit. Um, there's like a minute and a half minute, five, six, seven seconds left. And Olivia Somiel had a turnover in a, like right on the, on the outside of the arc. Um, Amor again, missed that layup. Um, like just, you know, not that, that there were, that was the reason why tech lost, but like those little things add up and you look at the other side, Sarah Andrews and Jada Walker were terrific for Baylor and Walker hadn't really like scored out of her mind all year and then goes off for 28. And it was like every single time Baylor needed a bucket, she just drove right to the rack. I thought tech got blown by a bunch of times. And like in a close game like that, you get one more stop. You like that could be the difference in the game. And even crazier. I thought is the fact that, Walker goes off for 28 in 26 minutes because she was in foul trouble. Yeah. Like she didn't even play the whole game, um, which is crazy as well. Something that I thought was interesting on, on Clara Strack here, we, we talk about and 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 Amor kind of went to Strack's defense in a press conference earlier this week. Like she's not baby Liz. She's not Liz Jr. Like she's Clara Strack, right? She's, she's her own player. Um, but you look at the fact that there are three tech players that played against Baylor in 2021. That was the last year under Kim Mulkey when these two teams met in the round of 32. Amor played in that game. Kayla King played in that game. And Liz Kitley played in that game. All of them started. Kitley played all 40 minutes of the game. She finished with six points and six rebounds in all 40 minutes. Now, granted, it's comparing apples to oranges, but Clara Strack in her freshman year, that was Kitley's sophomore year against Baylor, just went off for 18 and 10. So... Yeah, that was a you different. Know, that was a different Baylor. Team. Different Baylor team. Different. I said apples to oranges, yeah. but with, with that being said, Liz wasn't Liz in her first couple of years. Clara is showing that not, now she's not Liz, but she can put up big numbers in big spots early in her career as a freshman. Yeah, I think I'm, I, Kenny Kenny has a really cr- close relationship with Clara, and I think some aspects of Clara's game in some ways are already better than Liz. I think she's way more mobile. Um, I, I said to Andy, I, uh, she had a, a block, a secondary defender block where she like slid over and it didn't look like she was going to get to it. And then it was like first half and just like smacked, it, smacked the ball away. And I told Andy, I was like, she has that makeup speed that Kitley doesn't. Um, now she, she's more around the basket right now. And, but that's what Liz was as, as a, as a freshman, sophomore too. And tell me if you agree with this. I think she finishes through contact better than Liz did early in Liz's career. Yeah. Um, I think, and I, I can't remember if I was talking to Andy about it yesterday. Um, but one of the reasons like, like Liz finished through contact early in her career. Cause that's what she did in high school, right? Like she was used to being one of the taller players and just bumping people around down there. But I think Kenny Brooks understood that if she, she's going to be really, really good. She can't be taking all this contact every time. And that's when tech, like that tech moved her away from the basket. And she basically became a walking bucket from out there (laughs) where you run a, run a set for her. She catches the ball on the baseline or at the elbow. She turns around, shoots it. And you know, it's going in and she perfected that. And Claire's just a freshman. And I think she's already showing terrific signs and like, um, and I think it's, it's very, it, it's funny because you can like, look at the similarities. Like Liz was not a good free throw shooter her freshman year and Clara thought she was better yesterday, but against Marshall, she missed a, a handful that I'm sure she would like to have back. But I think Liz went from like shooting in the mid sixties to like 78% freshman to sophomore year. Like what that jump can be potentially for her. I'm very interested to see it because She's the the future at that spot for Virginia Tech. And I think Virginia Tech fans really got a good glimpse of what she can do. And she's also, you know, like Liz Kitley didn't have Liz Kitley to learn from. Liz Kitley kind of had to do it on her own. And I think it'll benefit Clara in the long run that she had somebody like Liz to learn from, even if that meant 
she wasn't starting playing 35 minutes every single game this year. But that, like, you can't, I think you can't underestimate that tutelage, if that makes sense. In hindsight, maybe, should have been, maybe she should have been playing 35 minutes a game every year. You go with the old Twin Tower offense. I know yeah. they did that later in the season. But. Yeah, but I also <laughs> think Clara now is not the Clara in that, January. No doubt. Like, yeah. like she was a completely different player. What The thing that impressed me the most about Clara last night was not on the floor. It was her press, her press, how she answered in the press conference off the floor. Like, in December against, I don't want to say it was like Houston Christian, they brought her into the – she had like 19, and they brought her into the to the press conference, and it was like her sitting next to like I think Georgia and Liz. And Claire said like all of five words. <laughs> so like she was just sitting there shy. And like yesterday she answered a bunch of questions. Like – and they were good answers. She's still maturing. She's young. She's 18. Like she's 18. She's kind of – you know, young for her class, like Liz was like, um, you know, so I, she continues to mature and continues to kind of, I think, find like she really found herself at the end of the year. And I, Kenny mentioned he had a sit down conversation with her, but like in the week off tech had, and basically said, we've talked about you, you know, you're going to be good. You're going to be good. You have to be good. Now. She was really good this weekend for Virginia tech. I think maybe better than a lot of people thought. Like, you know, if you if I if I told you Virginia Tech was going to get 18 and 10 from Clara Strack yesterday, like I'm sure you would have taken no it. No doubt. So like I I mean, man, what what that transformation is has been and and will continue to be pretty crazy to see. It's always kind of fun to watch players get more polished throughout the course of their careers. Andy will remember the famous Greg Stroman interview. So, do you like returning punts, Greg? Yes. Yes. Yes, that was his answer when he was a freshman. It's like, well, yeah. that's on me. That's on us for asking a yes or no question. But. <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> but, you know, by the end of his career, he was a much more polished guy. And, and you know, you talk to him and it's fine. It's, but so, yeah, you see guys uh, or girls in this case uh, gain that polish throughout their course of the years as they, get, as they get used to playing, as they get used to getting interviewed, as, as they gain more confidence. They get media trained right. a little bit. I think right. that's part of it at this level sure. uh, as well. Chris, I wanted to ask you a question and allow anybody else to chime in, of course, and then I promise we're going to get into the, the Kenny Brooks conversation after this. Is this the great? Is this the biggest what if in the history of Virginia Tech athletics? Probably. Um, I, you know, Michael Vick getting hurt before the 2000 Miami game would be another one because, you know, Tech only lost one game that year, and that was the game where he was hurt and only played one quarter. That said, I still think Miami would have won that football game because Tech just couldn't stop. Tech defensively could not stop Miami that day. They scored 42 points and probably could have scored more. Um, but, but you know, you, you, could, you could probably say that. Now, I will say that, like, last year's team made the Final Four – this year's team, you know, depending on the draw, could have done the same thing. But at the same time, I don't, I f don't feel like their ceiling was as high as last year's team because I think last year's team was more athletic. Um, so whereas I think last year's team could conceivably have won the national championship, I don't know that this year's team would have had a good a chance because they're not quite as athletic as last year's group. But at the same time, if you get that far, then you know you do have a shot. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think baseball a couple years ago uh, had a really good chance, and then you know Griffin Green had that fi finger injury the exact wrong time when the, when they got to the NCAA tournament, and you know they were able to get through the you know the regionals without him. But then you run into a really really good team like Oklahoma, and y you don't have one of your key starting pitchers, and you get to your bullpen early in the series, and and that that's it. Baseball's um, so random, though. It is. A, it a is. single guy like that is not going to... I mean, you see teams win the College World Series that have no business... Well, Tennessee being, Tennessee <laughs> was clearly the best team in baseball that year and didn't right. win it. I mean, yeah. that's, was base, that that's baseball, Miss period. I, mean, I believe so. Yeah. Ole Miss was the last team to get in and won it all, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think of big what-ifs. You know, what if Marcus Vick doesn't get booted, you know, before 2006? Right. I feel like those teams, you, you look at those teams, you go, man, those defenses were so incredible. They needed an offense to do that. They didn't really have that, you know, six uh, quite like they did, you know, the level of, of player they had before that. So uh, I don't know. It's tough. I mean, it's certainly a big what if. I think I'm with Chris. I think last year's team had higher potential than this one's. I feel like looking back last year, 
kind of should have won the national championship. I mean, they were what up eleven. They were leading the fourth LSU quarter late. against LSU. Then you see what LSU did to Iowa in that title game, and you're like, man. And South Carolina got upset by, I know, by and Iowa. It just yeah, opened yeah. up for you, and, and oh man, you look back. And You'd then, like you to know, have that quarter over. Golden opportunity uh, miss there. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I think I was just I was just thinking um, one of the more recent. Uh, and this came to my head because I saw a tweet yesterday of it. One of the more recent Virginia Tech basketball what ifs um, probably was Chris Clark. The the, the whole Chris Clark. Cl- I mean, Cl- Chris Clark if he's on not that, being on that team and Justin Robinson getting hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And that was still a four seed that made the Sweet 16. Yeah. But I, but I think one of the – I think one of the things that makes this – so tough for a lot of people to process maybe is that and Kenny Brooks said it last night man Virginia Tech was playing its best basketball Virginia Tech won 10 straight games and had a bad game at Notre Dame and I was there I witnessed it Notre Dame outplayed them um and you know I don't Tech started off slow at UVA but was finding its footing and if I I I am convinced that if Kitley does not get hurt. Tech wins that game handily um, just because Tech was starting to find its groove and then all the air got sucked out from its side. But, like, uh, I don't know. I think it's it's really, really tough because it's like this is this team was right there last year, and then you think this team will be right back there this year, and it shows everything up to that Notre Dame game. The NCAA tournament committee had Tech as the overall number five team in the country. And then you lose at Notre Dame. And then you lose Liz. And you lose to Virginia. And then you get punched by Notre Dame in the ACC tournament. You go from a one seed and you're out to being out in the second round. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, just really tough. A lot of what ifs. You know, and, and I thought Georgia Amor had really good perspective. Uh, Andy included in in his story. Um, she said that it, this does not define our season. You know, we had a really good season. First ever ACC regular season champs. What they accomplished in the regular season was amazing. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of people will look back on this. And as Kenny Brooks said, this was not how it was supposed to end. This was not how it was meant to be. Like, and one of the things is, like yesterday, I was watching the Ohio State-Duke game, and Duke upsets Ohio State, 7 seed being the 2 seed. And I'm thinking, man, if Virginia Tech can get past Baylor like, and ends up with like a team like Duke, potentially, on the other side of the, you know, maybe in the Elite Eight, like obviously, that, like, like I thought it might, might be setting up for Tech. But, yeah, I, I, think, I think for a lot of people, it'll really be a what if because – like especially you had in the college game day aspect of it, it wasn't like Tech was just playing its best basketball. Tech was in the national spotlight, and like big picture, we can talk about that. But like Tech was, people were talking about Virginia Tech as legit having an opportunity to to get back to the Final Four stage, and everything kind of just crumbled. And like Andy said earlier, to go back to to that point. Tech fought admirably yesterday and should be proud of, like, like if you're a Tech fan, you should be proud of what that group did yesterday. It just stinks that it just kind of had to end like that when at the beginning of the year, last couple, you know, a month ago, it felt like this team was really, really capable of having another dream season. So is this how it ends? Um, Obviously, Kenny Brooks has been attached to Kentucky women's basketball. That's no secret at this point uh, on social media as the front man in their eyes for that job that was reported by, I believe, a radio uh, host in Lexington earlier this week. It was touched upon in his press conference. He seemed focused but definitely didn't deny anything on this upcoming weekend. Um, What do we know about Kenny Brooks' future at Virginia Tech, if anything? It's cloudy. Um, he didn't. He did not deny it. He was asked about it. Um, Mark Berman of the Roanoke Times talked with Whit Babcock, Texas Athletic Director, last night. Um, I know Andy read it too, and I'm sure Andy has some thoughts on it as well. I, I thought it, you know, good on Mark for for talking to Whit and asking those questions, but I don't think Whit said anything 
mind blowing. I think the he the way he kind of put it was it feels like the ball's in Kenny's court. Um, one thing that stuck with me from last night was Kenny Brooks saying, talking about the Final Four and saying we belonged. And I think some people had this have this look that you cannot be suc- like you could not be successful at Virginia Tech in women's basketball. And Kenny Brooks has turned it into a place that has consistent success. And he's shown that you can get to the Final Four. He's shown that you can win the ACC, which I would say is the best conference top to bottom in the country. And now here come the Kentucky rumors, and I think a lot of people are asking why Kenny would leave. Um, From my research, Kentucky has a lot of money. (laughs) <laughs> in, in, I mean, like that's putting it broadly uh, for context in 2012, Matthew Mitchell was the Kentucky women's basketball coach. He was in the midst of an eight year, eight consecutive, eight straight NCAA tournament runs. And he got a raise in 2012 and he was making a million a year. And that was in 2012. Think about what, the backing for that program might be now. Now, obviously, they got to deal with the whole John Calipari thing if they really want to buy out his $33 million contract. But if Kentucky's serious about, if Kentucky's really serious about success, it it has the money. Um, now, I think Virginia Tech can make a very competitive offer. Um, but I think it comes down to what, Kenny wants to do. And if there if if there are programs around the country that have money to spend on women's basketball, like top two programs right now that come to mind that are looking for head coaches are Kentucky and Miami. Katie Meyer, that coach retired retired there after like 18 or 19 years and um, one of my favorites to cover. But legend. Um <laughs> but if you're looking for a head coach, Kenny Brooks is and Kenny Brooks is open, he, he's listening. He's the hottest name on the market from what he's done. So I, it's, I, we don't know anything, but I think it feels like the ball's in Kenny's court. Yeah. Um, we certainly know there's heavy interest. We don't know whether he's been extended the offer um, for sure or not, but that's one of those things that's like conference expansion. You don't get an offer unless they know you're going to say yes, right? Um, so I'm sure there have been heavy conversations. I, I did – on Friday before the game, I talked to someone with knowledge of the situation um, who told me that it's not looking good. Um, but that was Friday. I don't know if anything's changed since. Th- these things can change on a daily basis. We'll see. Um, as far as Kentucky, you know, they've got their own separate women's basketball facility. They've got an arena that's about the size of Castle Coliseum only for the women's basketball program. Um and they've got SEC money. Like with the SEC's TV contract these days, they throw off all this excess money. It's not the sal- necessarily like a salary that, that concerns me about like, oh, he would leave for this amount of money. It's just I, I think it's the extra resources, having his own arena. Um, it would not shock me even if like Kentucky decided to make him an NIL offer saying you will have this much money to spend on recruiting every year and those the, the, those are things that like I, I think Virginia Tech could conceivably make him could conceivably make him one of the top 12 or 15 paid coaches in the country which I think would be very fair considering his accomplishments in the game but it's the other stuff like you can't build him his own arena right uh, the only way to get him a sizable chunk of NIL money is to take it away from football let me tell you right now that's not happening the, the number one thing that is in if it, if this is just Kenny Brooks in a vacuum here then you know it's a no brainer but if you're an athletic director you're like a president or a governor you're never going to be able to make everybody happy the the they are I can tell you that this administration is deeply concerned about football realignment and they think it's it's going to clear up within the next eighteen to twenty four months or thereabouts and there there's major concern that tech will not be in the power too and that's why they're dedicating all these resources to football and funneling almost all their NIL to football to try to make sure they have a seat to be as good as possible when the music stops. 
and it's it's because like if tech doesn't end up in one of those power two conferences and then let's say their te- te- television revenue five years from now was like drops by like a third you can't tear up all those con- con- all those big money contracts that you sign coaches to right you would have to honor those contracts while bringing in a lot less money in revenue. So there is a big picture here for Virginia Tech where they can only go up to a certain amount. And then there's other things to consider too, like obviously the assistant coaches would get a bump. And I'm, I'm sure Kentucky is offering more, just more money in general, but more, you know, you know, operating budget money. I ran, I ran the numbers just looking at the 2013-14 staff at Kentucky versus what? the tech staff is making now and it's over like 150 i think it's almost like 200 grand difference right right and that 200 was, 000, yeah two 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 hundred thousand. 200,000 and that was 10 years yeah, ago difference. before the yes. sec contract really kicked in yeah right and now they've got a lot more money to spend so uh and you've also got to think about okay at some point some SEC school is going to come after Pete DeMoor. You're going to double his salary then? And at some point, some SEC school is going to come after John Sheff, and we'll talk about this later. Looks like it's a decent chance they're going to be hosting again this year. You're going to double his salary then? So you set these precedents. You double everybody's salary and give them huge raises every time another school tries to hire them. Just like that, your finances are upside down in the athletic department if you do that, especially when you don't know if you're going to be bringing in the same amount of revenue in a few years because of conference realignment. So like I said, if this is just in a vacuum, you're talking about just Kenny Brooks, just Virginia Tech women's basketball, then you do whatever you can. Yes. But when you have an entire athletic department to manage financially, it's, it makes things a lot more difficult. And like I said, I I sympathize with Whit Babcock because whatever happens, someone's going to be unhappy. A lot of people will be unhappy. No, no matter what happens, somebody's going to say you made the wrong decision. Yeah, I, I think just regarding Kenny, it, it kind of comes down to at this stage in his career, what does he want? Uh, you know, he's fifty-five years old. Uh, he spent his entire life in Virginia. I mean, the VMI assistant, James Madison assistant, head coach, uh, coming down here as a head coach. You know, played at JMU. Uh, you know, this is his home. This is where he's been his entire life. And I wonder sometimes if you get to a point in your career and you look around and you go, what else might be out there? What could I accomplish if I, I try something, you know, break out of this comfort zone and go somewhere else. And you look at where Virginia Tech is, is the program, you know, Kitley obviously exhausted her eligibility moving on. Amor has a decision to make here. I mean, she's 23. She's pretty high on those WNBA mock drafts. You wonder if she would just like to move on too. it feels like this is sort of a, and turning the page moment in the program's you know history here, and I'm I'm, you know, I'm not saying the cupboard is bare here. You saw what Strack and Act did in that game. You saw what some of the other players are capable of. I don't think Virginia Tech just falls off the map, but I think you come back and you go, that's not a f- ready-made Final Four team like it was this year. This is like I don't know, it feels like this crescendo just ended here uh, at Virginia Tech, and it's going to take some work to get it back up. So. If you're looking, thinking of making a move and looking around, this would be the time, I think, to do it with those, you know, Kitley moving on, potentially more as well. So I, I think you just kind of look where a coach is in his career and you go, it would make sense if he decided to, to look somewhere else. This would be the time to do it. Taking the 10,000-foot view and taking off my Virginia Tech hat, I, I agree with you. And, and there's, there's also some talk that the Tennessee job might be open after next year and that he would be one of their top targets. So, like, if you're Virginia Tech, you could succumb to every demand right now and give him whatever he wants to stay, and then you could end up having this exact same conversation a year from now. Mm. Um, So it's just – it is what it is. A lot has changed in the last 15 years in college sports. When when the ACC first expanded in 2004 – ACC teams were making more money per team from their TV contract than SEC teams were. I know that's hard to believe, um, but it's true. And now it is the other way around by a mile. So uh, it makes it very, very difficult to hang on guys to guys. And uh, like you sit there and look at women's basketball, softball, and baseball, all highly successful right now. 
you you can't if you're Virginia Tech, you can't pick everything, right? You you have you have to you have to make choices. And you have to make choices not knowing what where the future lies. Like not knowing what the conference landscape is going to look like two years from now. Not knowing how these courts are going to rule on the Florida State Clemson situation. Right? Once that ball gets rolling, you don't know where it's going. So I, I think you can take certain risks with football because football drives the bus. But for other sports, you commit so much money to them right now in signed contractual terms, and then three years from now, your revenue isn't as much because the conference landscape has changed. That, that's just a very difficult thing to do. So we'll see where it goes. But ultimately, I don't think this is necessarily going to be about the money thing to Kenny Brooks. Yes, it helps, but uh, but I, I, th- I think Andy hit it on the drum head. I, I think you reach a certain point in, in your career and you're like, I've done really well at Virginia Tech. But two of my three kids are out of the house. Um, and I can go to a place that has won national titles in men's basketball. And I have my own arena. Maybe they're promising me a certain amount of NIL money to spend on recruiting. Uh, if I don't make this move right now, I'll never know what I can truly accomplish. I'll always look back and say, what if? That could be part of the thought process. And that so, gets to, every coach gets to that point in their career. Yeah. I mean, Frank Beamer famously agreed to take the North Carolina job. It was yeah. more resources, better opportunity, and then, you know, he came back and he couldn't get back on the plane. It's like, you know, I didn't build it there. I built it here. I mean, maybe that's what, you know, Witt tries to play up in his conversations with Kenny. He's like, this is what you've built here. You know, you're going somewhere else for some what somebody else has done. So... Uh, you know, it's tough for these coaches sometimes to, to make a decision to leave. And uh, you know, I guess, well, if it happens, it'll happen pretty quickly here. I mean, with the transfer portal and, and all the roster shuffling that takes place and the recruiting window that's going on right now, you have to make this move quick. And if he does go, Virginia Tech will have to move quick to bring somebody in and you know get this roster settled for next year. Can you imagine if social media existed during the whole Beamer to UNC stuff? <laughs> because these days, like he took a visit to UNC. He like and, yeah, he like flew down. Yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. These days, coaches don't do that because they get their picture taken. It's all over Twitter, and Coach So and So was visiting this campus <laughs> and things like that. Like that, that would have been that would have that would have been a circus. And also, UNC let him leave without a signed contract. Oh, big mistake. <laughs> it was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Andy, you mentioned uh, if something happens, Tech's going to move quick. I mean, we we know Wit Babcock is somebody who keeps an, an, a list. He he has no shortage of names, uh-huh. I'm sure. Um, and if something happens, I've I've already been, you know, just to have a basis. I've already researched some names, and um, you know, I'm, I'm as has been the discussion in many places. Sean Poppy, former assistant coach, who. You know, led Chattanooga to back-to-back NCAA tournaments. Uh, he, of course, would probably be one of those people higher up the list. But, yeah, um, I think Andy's perspective right there was really good. Um, yeah, w- w- I think I think so often we can get caught up in the sports of it all. But, and, and, and he is a Virginia guy. Um, Andy mentioned his previous stops. He grew up in Waynesboro. Um, he and Whit go back to their JMU days. This is his home, but does he feel like it's time for a life change? And that's something only he and his wife Chrissy can answer. And when it's you know it's interesting, like looking at when when he came here in 2016, he his daughter Kendall. And, you know, went to play for him. Chloe was in high school, and I believe Gabby, his youngest, was in middle school. And now Gabby's on the team. And the other two are, you know, graduated. And, um, like, a lot's changed. And, like you guys said, per- it seems like the perfect time. It, I think it honestly comes down to, does he want to continue building something? Um, you know, and... The way I look at it is if he's somebody who continues to have this kind of success and decides to stick around and build it, there's no reason why a while down the road he couldn't have a, a statue like Frank Beamer outside a castle for him, right? Does he want to continue building something like that? Or does he feel like 
coaches always, and everybody does, I think, it's human nature to, to want another challenge, right? To want to take on the next thing, to want to move on, breath of fresh air. Does he think that's the next step in his career to, to take on a new challenge? I, you know, the SEC is very different from the ACC. It's all more physical. Um, and, you know, South Carolina South and LSU Carol- are they're, they're pretty good. Yeah. Are powers. <laughs> Um, that Tennessee job would not surprise me if it came open. Um, but it looks like Kelly Harper is going to stay there for now. Um, and I think the other big ACC coach to keep an eye out for those openings is Carol Lawson at Duke. But, um, you know, but she's having pretty good success there. But, like, it, you know, is, is this what he feels like maybe is like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get to the SEC? I don't know. And that's only something I think Kenny can answer at the end of the day. I think that it's kind of like like you guys are saying, strike it while the iron's hot type of thing because if this team does have some sort of digression, right? And that doesn't that doesn't mean they're a bad team. That just means they're not going to the final four. It means they don't have Kitley and Amor anymore. Right. right. Two years from now, this this might never be an opportunity again. And it is like a this this could be whether his heart is still in Blacksburg or not, this might be the only chance he ever gets to move up. He might cry on his way out of town, but he'll feel like it was the right decision. It'd be one of those things. And, and I, I want to throw this in here. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't be worried about Kenny Brooks leaving or anything like that because he's a proven coach, a very good coach. He's done a great job. I want to point out, though, Whit Babcock's hiring history at Virginia Tech. And, and, you know, he missed the mark a little bit with Fuente, but nobody's got a perfect record. But look at his three basketball hires. They've all accomplished things at Virginia Tech that nobody accomplished before them. Buzz Williams was the first Tech coach to make three straight NCAA tournaments and go to a Sweet 16. Kenny Brooks is the first Tech coach to, first women's coach to win the ACC and make the Final Four. Mike Young is the first men's coach to win the ACC title. Each one of Whit Babcock's basketball hires has done something that no other tech coach has done before. He's been out. I bet he's got a top five or ten resume in the country in terms of hiring basketball coaches. And Olympic sports coaches in general. Like his baseball coach, Super Regionals, first time ever. Possibly going again this year. Again, we'll get into that later. Softball, Super Regionals two years in a row. They look like they might be doing something like that again this year. Whit Babcock is outstanding at hiring coaches. Um, and don't well, don't, we, for, don't forget he promoted Tony Roby. Tom promoted Tony Roby. I mean, I'm, I'm want, probably leaving some other, some other people out too, and I don't mean to, but you get my point. Uh, not ever you're not gonna you can spend your whole life looking for a Frank Beamer and every coach that is loyal and stays forever, and that's not gonna happen. Um, what has JMU done? since Kenny Brooks left. They hired a coach who's won 70% of his games, which is pretty much the same thing Kenny Brooks did at JMU, right? Coaches leave. Be good at hiring. Whit Babcock is good at hiring. That's a good way to end it. That, that, is, a, that is a really good way to end it. I think the naive part of, part of me is like, he would never leave Blacksburg, Virginia guy. David can attest. I think Kenny... In my couple of years here, and, and I, I think you might agree with this, one has meant more to the community than probably any other coach but Beamer. Brent Pry certainly has his stake at that um, as well. But I, what he's done for student journalists, like he cares, and he, he built a relationship with our program and with Bill Roth, and uh, we I've learned more from him than any other coach. He comes into our classes and talks to us about how coaches know how to talk and how to be in a press conference and things like that. And, and then off the, you know, off the classroom and stuff, the things that you can learn from him, he's the perfect coach to learn from. I think you can attest to that as well. Yeah. I mean, I started covering this program when I was a freshman in college, 2016, 17. Yeah. yeah. That was Kenny Brooks second season. And the only two people, um, and I've told Kenny this, the only two people in the, there was an tech played in the NIT that year. The only two people in I think in the post game from the tech play George Mason at home I think it was just me and Mark Berman and like now there's all this women's basketball coverage because the program is has has been trending up and and is doing historic things and um and yeah I mean Kenny Kenny's been very influential on VTSMA in third through four um when we first started third through four he was he would spend time after the games, doing stand-up interviews with us, like unheard of. Mm-hmm. Um, 
he's he's been very instrumental in my career um and you know and and i i was reflecting on this last night um when i think about elizabeth killian george amor and kayla king man I, um you know i hope georgia comes back because all, because of what she gives to virginia tech and and what she will be bring as a basketball player but man, they are just so fun to cover and be around. They are the right people, and Kenny Brooks is the right kind of person. And um, and they've I, it has been such a joy to cover those three players. Like there have been so many players, um, Asia Shepard, who I was really close with because she was a comm student as well. Um, yeah, like. So many really, really good people have come through that program, but they have been the staples and they have led in the right direction. And um, I'm a, you know, I'm an, I'm gonna miss covering them. Like they were, they were really, really good, which yeah. made my job easy. But yeah. uh, but they're just they were the right people too. And um, and yeah, and and Kenny too, like you said, Gio. Um, you know, he's been very instrumental in, in so much. I, I think I think maybe the craziest thing is. He has rallied an entire community around Virginia Tech women's basketball. Like there were times, a, a lot of times, even in his like fourth year, they were like begging people essentially to come to games. And last night was maybe the great, the greatest women's or men's basketball crowd of the year. And that place was jumping and it was mm -hmm. raucous. And like what he has cultivated in Castle Coliseum is is unbelievable. And it's a credit to his staff and his players. And um, the fact that he's been able to rally community like that is, is honestly just crazy. Yeah, watching, watching Evan do his job from a bird's eye view and obviously admiring him and looking up to him. It's not every situation that you get a coach like Kenny Brooks where you say, I want to work for a guy like that and cover that team and, and be the voice of that team because he makes Evan part of the family. Um, Obviously gives an incredible story to tell. That's easy to say. When you're winning anywhere, it's more fun, right? Uh, but but just the way that he interacts um, and truly cares, like that, that that's the kind of coach that someday I, I hope I can work for, and I think we all do, right? Uh, anyways, we flipped the script. Uh, we talked about women's hoops for quite some time. Time to dive into men's hoops a little bit here. But first, I got to tell everyone that, as always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. As our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring you all the great content across all of our platforms. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Bank with First Bank and Trust Company. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. Men's hoops, tough one in the second round of the NIT on the road in Columbus, fell to Ohio State. Andy, you were up there in Columbus quite the uh, couple of days for you. You had women's hoops, then up to Columbus for men's hoops, right back down for uh, for women's hoops. So kind of paint the picture for us. Uh, yeah, it was sort of what it's been all season. I mean, they were 2-10 and ten in true road games this year, um, and they were in a lot of those games. They just couldn't get over the hump in them. And, uh, you know, I think on, what was it, Saturday night, it was kind of uh, indicative of the whole season. I mean, they they scrapped their way back into it. They got close. They were within three, I think, with four minutes left, and then turnovers on four of their next five possessions. Only got one shot off. Ohio State pulls away. Uh, a lot of fouls. Uh, you know, free throw line was basically where Ohio State won that game. They were 29 of 32 from the free throw line in that game. One guy was 17 of 18. So, uh, you know, right there, just just sort of emblematic of the season. They didn't have enough firepower. They did not have uh, enough front court help, enough back court help. To, that uh, you know, when you're relying on two guys to really carry the scoring load, and uh, Padula and Couture just need some other guys on the team to do it. And they didn't have that, and you know, that's something they're going to have to address in the off season. I think there's going to be a lot of movement. I think people will lament a lot of the movement and I'll look at it and go, well, the roster this year got them to the second round of the NIT. So it's not like you're working with the final four squad here. Uh, it's going to take a lot of retooling for this team to, to turn things around. Retooling. I, Mike Young used that word. And I think I'd used it in, in a couple of articles over the last month or so that you're going to have some retooling at the end of the season. Um, you're going to see outgoings. You're, you're going to see incomings. It's important to note that, that Mike Young, direct quote after they lost the other night, he said, the NIT is not good enough. Yeah, you yeah, want me to read the quote? The quote. Yeah. quote, we're based on getting to the NCAA tournament. That's the way it is, Young said. This is from Andy's story, by the way. 
We've been to two. We've been to two NITs. The NIT isn't good enough. That is not a slight on the NIT, but the job from this second forward is retooling, making those return better, and getting back to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's such an odd team, and the, the, they're night and day uh, between home and on the road. I mean, when they play at home, a lot of times they look like an NCAA tournament team, and their re- their record suggests they're an NCAA tournament team. But it's the direct opposite on the road. It's like it's not like they were miles and miles away from making the NCAA tournament th- this year. I mean, they were in all, almost all of those road games, and and. God, they, I mean, six of their 11 non-conference games were against NCAA tournament teams, and they won three of them. I mean, they played more NCAA tournament teams in non-conference than they did in conference. Well, they beat in three of the Sweet 16, right? Right, right. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so it's, yeah. like I said, they're not miles and miles away. They're, they're, they're closer to making the NCAA tournament than they are, like, dropping out of the NIT. Yeah. Right, right? Um, so, so they're right there on the cusp of things. Um, I, I think... You know, again, unfortunately, they they lost Rodney Rice before the season began, and and, and I think that that hurt them as far as backcourt production and certainly backcourt depth. Um, I, Ohio State game, like I expected them to lose because it was a road game, but they didn't play bad. Like Ohio State, Ohio State changed coaches in the middle of the season, right? And with their interim, who has now been promoted to their head guy, what's their record with him? Like ten and Jake, two. Jake Diebler. Yeah. Uh, very, very good. They only lost like two or three times. Yeah, the, when one of those was in the Big Ten yeah. tournament. They beat Purdue, who was ranked second in the country. So basically, Ohio State, since they fired their coach midseason, has been playing like an NCAA tournament team at an NCAA tournament level. That was basically an NCAA tournament team that Tech played on the road the other night. And, and you know, they, they didn't play bad. It was just they played a very good team on the road. It happens. In Blacksburg, Tech probably wins because that's just the way <laughs> Tech has been this year. Um so, you know, it's it's going to be some, again, retooling of the roster. We don't know who's who's uh, going. We don't know who's coming in. If you, if you look at our subscriber board, I have made a page that lists all the players Tech has contacted already in the transfer portal, and I'll be updating that on a regular basis throughout the whole process. Um, but this transfer portal thing is going to be a process. We'll know within the next week or so who's leaving um, as far as who's – you think, it'll, you think it'll be in the next week? I would think within the next uh, couple. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't see. I mean, it's open. There's it's, no reason why you can't go. Right, right. That's true. And right. I mean, I, I figure, yeah, maybe sometime this week after Mike, they've had their conversations. A chance for exit conversations. Correct. Right. Sort yeah. Of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, as far as entries into the program, you know, we know they need power forwards because <laughs> they they don't have any. They need a lot. Yeah. You're right. Um, but we know with 100 percent certainty that they need power forwards. Um. But we don't know when the commits will happen, right? So in the past, we've seen some, like uh, Makai Long was in March of last year. As was Tyler Nickel. As was, as was Tyler Nickel. But if you go back to Justin Mutz, I don't think Justin Mutz was till like May or June. So this is going to be an ongoing process. So it's not going to happen. Elijah anymore. Poteet was not until like mid-June. I think, yeah, yeah. But like... Robbie Barron was, I think, after, after Northwestern season yeah. ended and after his. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be, you know, as we'll talk about towards the end when Gio asks what's coming up on Tech Sideline, uh, it's going to be a lot of keeping up with what is going on in the yeah. future portal. But, yeah, no, I mean, Andy talked, talking about the Ohio State game, man, and Andy hit the nail on the head. Very, this is kind of just how Virginia Tech season went. Bad turnovers at bad times, not having enough guys step up and be consistent like right there, but not good enough to quite get over the home. It was pretty, it was pretty similar to the Baylor women's game. You you, like, you're there on a number of times and then you can't quite get over the hump. And there's a ton of fouls called. (laughs) Yeah. At least tech tied it up a couple times. They they did the women's game. They they were never quite there. Well, they they did get off to a six, nothing lead though. Well, they it's seven, nothing seven out of the gate. And then, uh, it went downhill very right. quickly in the first half, yeah. uh, but you no, know, they they stuck around for a while. It's just I don't know. It just seemed like a team that just was la- lacking one or two guys right. to help them out there. And, and yeah, you, know, you look at Rodney Rice transfers. There's one guy, Darren Buchanan. You know, Makai Long wasn't playing for the second half yeah. of the season uh, with injury. I'm not saying he's like a you know difference maker, but he's another guy that could have been out there to help them, especially when all their bigs were in foul trouble yeah. in that Ohio State game. So. 
Uh, yeah, you need uh, more talented guys on the roster, and you need more of them because it, it's just tough to play with that thin of a group. Last thing mentioning here on men's basketball, definitely worth uh, a shout out to Hunter Couture. Legendary career uh, comes to an end. 103 starts, 1,505 points, 330 career three pointers. That is a program's all time record in a career. ACC champion, ACC tournament MVP, three time All ACC academic team. I mean, he's 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 a uh, face of this generation That's of tech exact, basketball. Exactly what we all predicted when he decided. To come from <laughs> well, Mike, like when he decided to go to Mike Texas Young brought it up afterwards. He's like, "Will you ever see a five-year player at a basketball program ever again?" Like somebody who's played for all five years. No, I'm, certainly I'm, not. Well, I mean, just like hope not. <laughs> even sticking around at one place for five years. Right. Yeah. Like if if you're at a smaller program and you go, oh yeah, they might be there five years. No, if you're good, you move on to a bigger program. If you're that good at a big program, you probably go pro uh, before you're there for that long uh, or transfer out to for, for a better opportunity. I, I think it's going to be increasingly rare that that happens. And uh, you know, a very good career. I've I've got a friend who is in the merchandise business both for Virginia Tech and, and for other schools. And he said, as far as Virginia Tech goes, their most requested jersey, when people walk into the store and say, hey, do you have this jersey? It's Hunter Couture. And he says, from what he can tell, longevity at, a, at, a sc- at schools, especially at Tech, equals more jersey st- sales. The longer you stay, the more relationship you build up with the fans if they like you the more they're going to want to buy your jersey and, th- and things like that. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, that, that, that he was, I mean, it's not surprising when you really think about it. But. Man, Hunter Couture is another guy, like, just thinking about, um, you know, it's kind of crazy. These are these are kids, I say kids, these are people between Elizabeth Kelly, George Amor, and Kayla King, but also, like, Hunter Couture that I covered when I was in school. That like, kind of ends that book for you. I know, right? a little, well... Who's he, still around that you covered when you were still in school, and not a professional yet? Is that it? That would be it. Makai Long. That would be it. No, 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 he was a transfer. Um, All right. I mean, that was the last wave. Couture was the last player from Mike Young's first ever season. Right. Um. Man, it's this, uh, and and another guy who's just a class act, man. Like, um, I'm so happy I had the opportunity to to. Talked to Hunter about his dad, Rodney, earlier in the year, battling uh, cancer and what that was like. He just Hunter has a, a phenomenal story. I mean, he's a kid from Orlando who grew up playing in AAU tournaments at Disney World, had an offer to go to Wofford, and Mike Young thought he was good enough to go play with him in the ACC, and Hunter didn't believe it. But Hunter went and did it, and... Mike Young talks about, you know, constants in the program. Hunter Couture was the constant. And just just a phenomenal character. Great basketball player. Um, man, I will never forget his... Is the the ACC tournament championship, man? I still go back and watch it every now and then. Really? Just, the ACC the, tournament final? He just, like, yeah. goes off for 30. 30. Yeah. Like, you know, that, like... He was built for that stage, and I I remember I took this picture, and I have it on my phone, of Mike Young and Hunter Couture, like, hugging, but also, like, just talking after that game. And I tweeted, I was like, what do you think they're talking about? And, like, he he's just been a class act all the time. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss talking with him. We like, need to get him on the podcast for a career retrospective. Yeah. I mean, he, he's come on before, he obviously. He needs to do it again. Yeah. Um, Hunter, I'm, I'm, he's just such a, like, like Andy said, when will you ever see a, a guy stick around for that long? Like, he, he's been, he was Mike Young's first ever recruit. And, you know, it's funny. I think this program's a little bit, not the exact same as the women's program, but at a similar crossroads, right? You have a, your your wave is over right what's next and i think for mike young we all know where he what he's doing um if the kentucky stuff wasn't a thing i think we all know kenny brooks would be doing very similar thing (laughs) you're recruiting the portal and it's funny kenny brooks mentioned last night he's like yeah i'm gonna start recruiting the portal tonight no, he didn't say for whom. For whom, <laughs> <laughs> as Andy noted last night, probably say. in general. <laughs> uh, but uh, but but like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, portal opened last week. I'm sure Mike Young 
I mean, tech, they offered a lot of guys, but I'm sure you know, they're going to be putting their head down and going to work here. Um, one, one thing I want to touch on, uh, GC Hokey 34 had a really good post on the boards and, um, he was, you know, you had 13 scholarship players in, in men's basketball and he went over Mike Young's five years. How many games all 13 scholarship players were available for? Out of how many games? Uh, like a, he, did he say how many games? Yeah. 158. 158. Four. Out of 158, Four. we had all 13 scholarship players. And about. all of them were in Mike Young's second season in which he made the NCAA tournament. R- right. And so he's had, and like, that's the nature of sports. Stuff's going to happen, and it's life. And, um, you know, from the Cartier Jada, um, from that to, uh, to that to got, you know, stuff like Darius Maddox leaving the team in the middle of the season last year to Rodney Rice leaving the season before this year. Right. Um, one of the things I'm most interested when I go into Mike Young's office over the summer and, and sit down and have a chance to talk with him is, what, how, how do you combat that in this day and age where kids want to leave all the time? Like, how do you approach it? So, like, injuries will obviously happen. And you can't con- necessarily control the kids. But, like, this year, I think what kind of doomed Tech was when Makai Long went down. What really doomed Tech. And I think that was an underrated part because he wasn't necessarily scoring a lot. But he played good defense and he rebounded. But Tech lost depth. Mm-hmm. And Rodney Rice leaving, Tech lost depth. It got to the point where, like, like the fact that Tech made the second round of the NIT is honestly sort of impressive considering how inconsistent a lot of the pieces were. So when Makai Long gets hurt, you not only lose depth at the four, because he's a four, but then you move Tyler Nickel there for at least part of the time, which means you also lose backcourt depth, right? Yeah. So then you're playing Jaden Young more minutes than he probably – should be, should have been playing for a freshman by the end of the season. So it all has a, a knockdown effect. So you want to have 13 scholarship players available so that when the inevitable happens and someone yeah. gets hurt, you have more guys to draw on. Uh, Tech had 12 this year. They were supposed to have 13, but Rodney Rice left in October. I think Mike Young has made some mistakes in the past where he did not completely fill out his roster. Last season being one of them, I think they only had 12 scholarship guys to start the season. And then once they had a couple injuries – and Couture, and, yeah, Maddox left. And Maddox Padula. left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think it uh, I think it hurts things there. But I, I think he learned his lesson, so to speak, and was planning on going into the season with 13 and then Rodney Rice, Rodney yeah. Rice. This is going to be very interesting just to see how he approaches the offseason. Uh, just because you guys got into this whole portal conversation, I'm just going to tee this up. We're not going to spend long on it real, real fast. I want to go to Andy first just to involve him in the conversation, and then anybody else feel free to chime in. <laughs> Kenny Brooks leaves. Clara Strat going with him. Like, does Georgia <laughs> give it one more go at a new place? Like, for like, like, is he taking some with him? And is the is the cupboard going to be bare? Like Andy kind of said, um, he, as right now it's not. But what is the likelihood that he takes some some luggage with him? Well, this is the threat uh, of a coaching change in this day and age. Is now that you know if the coach leaves, he might take all his best players with him. <laughs> I mean that you've seen that uh, a lot of times in football. Yeah, you know, Lincoln Riley going and, and Caleb Williams going with him uh, to USC. I mean, that, that's just the players have that freedom of movement and there's nothing stopping it now. There's not even like the second transfer stopping them. The NCAA can't do anything about that. So uh, this is why, you know, when, when we saw Brent Pry talking about retention and staff retention, it's a big deal because that gives you a little bit of continuity on your roster. Now, I'm not saying if Kenny leaves, those players automatically leave because, you know, maybe they have a connection to Blacksburg. They like it here. Maybe they would like the new coach that comes in if he if he happens to leave. I'm not getting ahead of myself on this whole thing. But, you know, that is just the the environment now and something you have to deal with. And it's why you like to have a coach stay in place and, and have that continuity. I think another thing, too, Andy touched on the players. I'll touch on the the staff. Um, this is a staff that from from the bottom to the top, this this is a staff that what I would think would, would for the most part follow him. So you're talking about, and and that not not surprising. I mean, when a new coach comes in, they want to have their own staff. Um, but I mean, from Aaron Cash, the trainer, Greg Werner, the strength and conditioning coach, all the way up to Tim Clark, chief of staff. I mean, they were th- those three were with Kenny Brooks at James Madison, and you look at 
the assistants. Some of them could maybe go get, I think Lindsey Hicks is maybe in line for a head coaching job, or some of them could go get other jobs elsewhere. But, I mean, this would be a, I mean, if it was something was to happen, it'd be a, you know, who knows about the players, but the staff for sure would like it, it'd be, it might, it could be bare across the board. It, it kind of all just depends. Um, but like Andy said, that's kind of the day and age we live in where it's like free agency a little bit. Yeah. It, it basically is what it is. I got nothing really to add to that. I mean, honestly, you never feel completely safe these days, whether your coach leaves or not. I mean, you could yeah. lose any player for conceivably any reason. You could also, but because of the transfer portal, you could also rebuild very quickly. Yeah. When Buzz Williams left Virginia Tech, would he leave Tech with like two or three scholarship players left? And he had used all the official visits already. So Mike Young had a very limited amount of official visits that he could use when he first arrived at Tech. So it was extremely difficult that to rebuild reset. that roster. That seems no, criminal. no, it doesn't. It doesn't. That's it's, messed it's, up. It's, you, you get what you get. That's crazy. So two years later, though, I mean, it seemed like a disaster, right? It seemed like a three-year rebuild. Two years later, Tech's in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So, yes. And, it's, and you can probably do it even quicker now, depending on if you get the right coach in. and maybe you Tech's mean, a name program. And, 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 and think about this. This is just hypothetical. If Kenny Brooks was to leave, well, who's saying the coach at Virginia Tech hires doesn't bring players with them? Correct. Right? Like, True, but like, who's to say Silva doesn't go join? Yeah, you know, I mean. He never plays a game you know, in a Tech jersey. It's, 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 always, it's always interesting with recruits. I mean, when, when Buzz Williams left, his entire recruiting class went elsewhere. Some of them went to Texas A&M. Some of them went like all over the place, right? It, it happens, and... That's why you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> that's why you shouldn't get like attached to these. Yeah, things. yeah. It's it's Fair. it's like you get attached to Hunter Couture after he stays for four years. Yeah, right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, because but other than that, you know, like Tyrese Radford was on pace to become a tie with like Jamon Gordon and Justin Robinson for my favorite tech basketball player of all time. And he just finished his third year at AM. Right, right. And then what happened happened, and then he left and. He scores 27 points and 15 rebounds last night as a 6-1 guard, which is why he would have been a tie for one of my favorite tech players of all time. But yes, point being, don't get emotionally attached, but that's really hard to do. It, it, what is the, uh, the the quote from Deion Sanders last year when he when he joined Colorado? He said, I'm bringing my luggage with me, and it's Louis. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, that's, <laughs> yeah, right. hopefully that's not what takes place here. All right, let's uh, turn Louis, the page. Louis went 4-8 and eight last year? Is that what they <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair oh, enough, fair enough. Uh, still an all-timer out of, out of prime time, no yeah. doubt. Um, let's flip the script here, talk, talk slight football here. Brett Clatterbaugh, a big linebacker commit, four-star out of Culpeper, Virginia. He's going to join uh, Virginia Tech in the 2025 class. Big get for the Hokies, Chris. It's funny. I, I get on Twitter right after he committed, and all of a sudden I see it. He's from Eastern View High School in Culpeper. So I get on Twitter right about the time he commits, and I see a picture of the Eastern View coaching staff with the Virginia Tech coaching staff at PK's on the deck. <laughs> they, were, they were in town for a coaching clinic this weekend. So there's the secret uh, sauce to recruiting. Just take the kids' coaches to PKs and have a fun night. Well, no, <laughs> take, well, have a clinic and yeah. have good. It comes down to relationships. Yes. Is your point? But yeah. yes, uh, PKs, right? Yeah, PK, PKs, like PKs is PKs the secret sauce. I've, been, I've that, been there a few times. That is the secret spot because <laughs> even they take the SMA kids there to get to get them to say, <laughs> "Hey, we're coming." I guess it's not going to be the not so secret spot anymore if we keep talking See, about it. But but you know, like, like big offer list. You know, good top five. Um, interesting pickup. You know, he's listed as a linebacker, but he doesn't play linebacker. He plays defensive end. So you can't really evaluate him from a standpoint of how are his run fits? What are his instincts as a linebacker? How good is he going to be in coverage? Because every play he's just rushing the passer or making tackles in the backfield or something. As a defensive end when you're not really reading as much. But uh, he's a big guy with a big frame um, and a big offer list and certainly keeps the in-state – uh, momentum going. You know, I think they made strides there uh, last year by signing a couple of top 10 guys. And this time you've got a borderline, at this point, top five guy. Um, and we all know the rankings can change uh, between now and the end of the process. But, uh, you know, this looks like a, a guy where you, 
you can point to early in the process and say, look, we, we got a commitment early from a top, top recruit. And we're doing well in the state so far this year, so everybody else get on board. Yeah, it's nice to get one in, in the boat in March. As you opposed know, to like July, July for yeah, last June, year. July is really hectic. Like they have one already, and I know it's not a binding commitment at this point, but you can say, hey, one top 10 guy right now. That, that's a good start. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, well, some more football news. Fontel Mines pres- pres- promoted excuse me, uh, to assistant head coach, still wide receivers coach and offensive recruiting coordinator, of course. But they just continue to kind of give Fontel Mines more responsibility and, and give him a raise, so to speak, move him up uh, title-wise. Uh, what does that say about his value uh, to this team? <laughs> Obviously, it's shown. Yeah, I think the way he recruits the state, um, you know, people are always worried about him getting hired away. Penn State made a run at him last year, of course. I don't know if anybody made a run at him this year or, or not. Um, I, I think I, I think Tech is in, in a good position with him because I think his value is a regional recruiter. So like Alabama is probably not Alabama recruits nationally. It's like they're not dependent on Virginia recruits. So Alabama, if they hired him, would hire him because they think he's a really good wide receiver coach. They they wouldn't hire him based on oh gosh we need to get Richmond kids right. So there's only a handful of schools that, that I think would, would scare me as far as coming to get him as a wide receivers coach. Penn State would have been one of them. You know, Clemson would be one of them. Um, North Carolina would be one of them. But he South would, he, Carolina? He, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's some rumblings that maybe Shane they're, they're, contacted Oh, him. I'm sure. I'm sure he, that would not shock me a bit. Um, Penn State would be the one that would have concerned me the most out of it's all of those. definitely the biggest though. name, right. biggest draw. But at this point, you know, what concerns me the most is maybe if uh, like a, like an FB or FCS school said, "Hey, head coach," you know, seriously, like one yeah. one of the one of the, one of the regional FCS schools with recruiting ties to Virginia, him leading the charge for that, um, that would concern me more than anything right now. Um, and he said, you know, that maybe his goal one day is to is to be a head coach. Uh, but, you know, we haven't had a chance to interview Pry yet since the promotion was announced. Uh, but you have talked to, to Mines himself. Yeah, we talked to Fontel, and he said, you know, it, it kind of comes into focus over uh, the time that eventually, yeah, he would like to be head coach. So this is, I guess, putting him in a position to do some of that stuff. It's sort of an ill-defined uh, position. Fontel didn't even really know <laughs> what exactly it entailed. Uh, you know, and we they didn't put out a release and haven't talked to Pry, so I don't really know... Uh, the background of all that stuff, but it's him, you know, being in some additional leadership meetings or being in front of people like Witt and John Boleyn and, you know, decision makers uh, in, at these athletic uh, departments. So uh, it puts him on the right track or at least gives him that title that you can point to it when you're out there uh, looking for other jobs, which is, you know, straight out of the James Franklin playbook where everybody has an additional title or there's a coordinator or, I mean, Virginia Tech has three coordinators, two recruiting coordinators, uh, an associate head coach, an assistant head coach. I mean, you can make the assistant to the head coach, assistant to the regional manager joke here with Dwight Schrute <laughs> all you want. Uh, so I, I don't really know how much uh, extra responsibility comes with all these titles, but when you're trying to be upwardly mobile, it's nice to have that title. Well, let's uh, let's continue on here as we move on to our other topics today. And I can't believe it took us this long to get this one. We got a national champion in yeah. Blacksburg. Caleb Henson takes home Virginia Tech's Virginia Tech wrestling second ever national title. Of course, Makai Long has the first. Hokies no, finished no, no, no. seventh. Makai Lewis. Makai Lewis, excuse me. Makai yes. L. Very, very important differentiation. Yeah, one's a national champion and a three or four time All American. Four time All American? One missed half four of the basketball season. Yeah. 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 Jack says four time All American, and the other one missed half of one season he played at Virginia Tech. That is, that is very true. Makai Lewis, first national champion. Caleb Henson brings home another. Hokies finished seventh in the NCAA tournament. Uh, of course, Henson wrestles at 149 weight class. What I thought was the, the coolest thing about it all was the fact that. Now you're kind of passing the torch, right? Makai Lewis is graduating his final year here at Tech. He was the leader of that locker room because guys could look at him as like, hey, he's a national champion. He knows what it takes. Well, now Tech has that again in Henson, and and he's got some more time left here uh, in Blacksburg, just a sophomore this year. So uh, really, really cool. I thought his interview after was fantastic. It was really fun to watch. 
when he dropped the f bomb. Well, <laughs> even after the f bomb, but Oops. yes, that was uh, hilarious. As um, well. Watching watching him wrestle is so fun. Um, you know, it's funny. I was texting Jack, and Jack is our wrestling expert. And Jack was like, "Oh yeah, I I have full belief that Caleb's going to win a national championship. No question." That was before like the bracket had even gotten announced. And uh, and Jack like cooked up a graphic and actually like pre wrote something because he was so confident that Caleb Henson was going to win. So good call, Mister Mister. How Jack. are you feeling? Uh, Ten seconds into the match. Yeah, he said he's feeling it because he got down three nothing quick. Yeah, quick so takedown. so he gets yeah. taken down. Took he, he got taken down immediately, and I thought, I think, uh, Jack uh, Austin Gomez was the Michigan wrestler's name, and I think what, um, what what, what Jack mentioned to me earlier was, um, you know, the Michigan guy Gomez is such an a- attacker, attacking minded guy. I think Henson probably went in early and just kind of like kind of showed a little too much and got taken out, but then he explodes for 15 points. It was like, it was like it didn't phase him. And I think that's like, he was, he scored the most points of any national champion on Saturday. And he was one of three guys to win by major decision. Like it wasn't like he just, you know, barely won. It was like, yeah, he got taken down first and then he, then he, just dominated, and so, he 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 put the guy on his back multiple times. I think he was gonna get a pin. Like he almost did. Yeah. Do, just just Caleb Henson dominated. It didn't start like that. It sure finished like that. It was like the military ball against Tulane. Okay, enjoy your lead. It's not gonna last very long. Yeah, he you're got right, a couple of punked. What four point? Um, and not one, maybe two. Yeah, he got some back. He got, he got some back points. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it it was it was a crazy thirty seconds when and Daniel Corey the 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 crew play by play wise by the way was like top tier. Love yeah. Mike Cousins. Uh, he he's great. He does the ACC tournament on ESPN Radio and stuff. So very familiar with him. And he spoke at the student media seminar and stuff. And then you pair him with Daniel Cormier, who is a wrestling legend and, and a UFC champion and uh, a, a UFC legend as well. Like, they're both going nuts. And Cormier's like, that was the craziest 30 seconds. He's like, he was down three, and now he's up 15 to three. Yeah. So it was and and Rock awesome. Harrison was... Yeah, I believe yep. Rock Harrison was there too. Yeah, um, five years to the day that Makai Lewis won his first national championship. That's just very crazy parallels. Um, and talking with Jack, this is a a program that finished seventh. You know, a, a couple places out of fourth. Um, I think like half a point you know, behind sixth. Um, and seven of the ten wrestlers are expected to return for next season. You want to talk about sustaining excellence? Like, yeah. that is Tony Roby and what Virginia Tech Wrestling are doing is kind of the definition of that. And like you said, passing the torch now, mm-hmm. right? Makai Lewis was the national, was Virginia Tech's first national champ. He's graduated, and what a career he had. Um, I mean, you want to talk about Mount Rushmore of Virginia Tech athletes. But now Caleb Henson. And Caleb Henson is a sophomore, and he's won a national championship. And um, now he's going to have a little bit of a target on his back. But, uh, yeah, just an awesome moment for Virginia Tech and uh, his interview afterwards. And then, like, just being mobbed by his team. Like, Tech had 10 wrestlers there. The entire team was basically there. Like, just so cool that he got to share the moment with all of them. Can't believe I said uh, Makai Long. Evan, Katie, and Jake would have never made a mistake <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> Let's go ahead and continue the conversation. By the way, that was awesome having Jake and Evan on set. That was that was oh, really wow. really cool to watch. Uh, softball split split with Alabama down in Tuscaloosa. Uh, first game they lost zero to one. It was really competitive the whole way through. And then the next one went into eight. Tech ended up pulling away in extras. Won it eight to three. Down in Tuscaloosa to beat Alabama, now Tech ranked 12th in the country, probably going to move up, uh, you'd have to expect. Huge series coming up this weekend in Durham against the fourth-ranked team in the country, Duke. But Tech softball, I mean, you said it earlier, Chris, this this looks like a team that could host a Super Regional. What are they, 25-5-1? and five and one? Yeah, twenty. Should so be, twenty six and five. Yeah, yeah, we'll call it. We'll call it. They yeah, also yeah, set the uh, program record for runs in a game yeah, with twenty five against was, Eastern uh, was, Maryland Eastern Shore yeah, last brutal. week. Um, but yeah, look, Tech has split away from Blacksburg against Georgia and Alabama. Um, this is a team with a very, very strong resume and some good teams on their schedule upcoming. 
with a chance to improve their resume even more. So this looks like a legitimate team that has a legitimate chance to make another deep run in the postseason. They are hitting like like they've always been really, really good at hitting the ball, but they are just like smacking the ball. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think the one of the most impressive things was Rachel Castine. She was playing earlier in the year. She was like national player of the week after having some like like four home runs in four days, something like that. Like something ridiculous. Yeah. She was putting up ridiculous numbers earlier. Since she's gone out, I believe Michelle Chatfield. Yep. She's, she's been off. terrific. Yeah. Like, and isn't like, she a freshman? Yeah. yeah. Like, te- like tech has not skipped a beat. Um, I, I, uh, I was keeping up with Sam Mostow who, and, and, you know, Chip was, Chip Grubb was down there and, and Sam Mostow wrote a recap after the game. And, um, you know, I was texting with Sam a little bit, but keeping up with the game, tech is up three, nothing going into the bottom of the seventh gives up three runs and tech could have easily folded. And then Tech exposed for five runs and puts the game away. I mean, Tech was, like, close to being walked off. And, like, that kind of resiliency, that kind of, like, you know, after losing one nothing on in, in the first game, to be able to be, kind of bounce back. And when you're on the road in a hostile environment, you're almost done. Then you bounce back and you win the game by five. Like, just this team, I think gearing up to be something special. The crazy thing is, is please correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no official, official timetable, but like it's not out of the realm of possibility that Castine returns to the lineup uh, as well. So you just add that bat back in. I mean, obviously she's missed some time and, and could be a little rusty, but that's just, that's just crazy. Um, a, a, a true embarrassment of riches uh, for Pete Demore, And he's got four pitchers this year, which is something that inside the circle he has not had Pretty much in his tenure here. Yeah. So more, we talked about that last week. Like he he said, one thing he learned last year is you need more pitchers and you need pitchers that throw different speeds. So you just can't. Br- you're not bringing in a, a relief pitcher who's basically the same pitcher as the starter. You've, you're giving the hitters something different to see. Right. Well, talking about pitching and pitching being an element that maybe was was not there, that is there now is bullpen pitching for Virginia Tech baseball. The Hokies uh, are ranked all the way up to 13th in the country now, which is incredible according to D1 Baseball. Coming off a, a good series again against Boston College on the road, Virginia Tech just cooking. They're off to an 8-1 and one start here in ACC play. Uh, that is Good for top of the ACC Coastal and all across the board. They're hitting the ball too, Chris. Yeah, um, to put that into perspective, in 2013 when they hosted in Blacksburg, they went 16 and 14 in the ACC. This is a really tough, deep league. If you have a winning record, you're going to have a very high RPI. So they're eight and one right now, and they've got last place Pitt rolling into Blacksburg this weekend. If you can sweep this weekend, you'll be 10 and one, and. You got to think at that point, the chances of you hosting again are going to be pretty darn strong. And like the softball team, they're uh, they're absolutely crushing right now. They're they're crushing. And the thing is, like they're they're doing everything well enough. Like they hit al- well almost every game, but in a game where they didn't hit so well, they won four to three. So they had really good pitching in that particular game. So they've pitched well when they needed it. They've hit well when they needed it. You know, which which is the signs of, of a good team. And they're just off to as good a start, uh, like I always thought they'd be able to hit this year. Pitching would be the question mark, but the pitching has been better than I think most people would have anticipated it being. And I think they're they're getting some some good innings by the bullpen so far too. Yeah, this is a well-rounded team. Um, you know, I think John Chef was he was like cautiously optimistic that this was going to be a good group pitching wise. He related it to the 2022 team about, hey, we like the guys we have, but. None of them have ever pitched in the ACC before. And uh, Wyatt Parliament was really good in, this, I believe, the second game of the doubleheader um, on Friday. And uh, Griffin Stig was pretty good yesterday. Brady Kurtner, I don't think he was – I believe he was not good on Friday, but then bounced back and was good on Three score Sunday. Three scores on next one, yeah. Um, like – Tech is put tech is getting good stuff from the guys in the pen. And that's important. And uh you got three pretty good starters. And and then when you can, can when you can hit the ball, I mean, we talked about Carson D. Martini last week, but like when 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 you can get timely hits like that, it makes you a really good team. And and I think the biggest thing is eight and one. 
I mean, you're saying if, even if Tech doesn't sweep this upcoming weekend, say Tech wins two games, you're looking at a team that's ten and two, and will have won every series it's played, and it has Wake Forest the following weekend, which obviously is huge at home. But if you can continue to build on it, and you know, for knock for Virginia Tech, knock on wood, stay healthy. I think that's what is kind of held Virginia Tech back or given them a couple road bumps, bump, bumps in the road here, there, the last couple of years. But but this team is kind of like firing on all cylinders right now. And I think we're kind of just seeing a glimpse of what this team could be if it continues to to hit full gear come May, June. Yeah, and it is important important to note that greater competition is coming. They, they have not played the, top the of best the of the ACC yet. Eight of the top 22 teams in the national rankings right now are ACC teams. There's a lot of good teams coming up on the schedule. But Tech is so far ahead in the standings now that, you know, they've got – they set themselves up very well. Um, this is – looks barring a disaster, this is a definite NCAA tournament team. Which is really, really cool to say, um, considering last year that was an opportunity that they did not have. Uh, felt like they were kind of on the bubble there mm-hmm. and then got a little derailed towards the end. Let's go ahead. I, I just, I'm just curious for, for conversation's sake, taking a look here. So Pitt coming up this weekend, and then probably the biggest home series of the year, at least the one that was circled heading into the season, was Wake Forest in mm-hmm. town. That's uh, the weekend after the Pitt series. And then Georgia Tech down in Atlanta. Duke, that's at English Field. Carolina, you play in Chapel Hill, Miami at English Field, and then Virginia on the road to close out the year. You actually avoid Clemson, Mm -hmm. Florida State, some of the really, really good teams in the league. It's an advantageous schedule, and most of the series from here on out are at home. And Tech took advantage of it to start, and that's important. Um, Boston College is a tough place to to for, to play, it was snowing. It was cold for a lot for a lot of sports. But like when when there's nobody in the stands, and um, I wonder if they serve, serve clam chowder at baseball games, uh, uh, it'd be enticing. Yeah. Um, but like, it's a place to win up there between the weather and probably not many people being there. And like, you know, tech like tech went up there and handled business. And that's not. Like, I, I don't take that for granted, I think. Tech is, is handled business thing. at Boston College in football and baseball this year. Wow. wow. Maybe we're heading in the right direction. And men's there. basketball beat Boston College at home. At home, right. For the, first time, ever, time under Mike for the first time ever under Mike Young. Take that, Boston College. Yeah, <laughs> there we yeah. go. I, yeah, the funniest thing was Will Stewart. Uh, he loves Boston College. Yeah, he, he – uh, I don't even remember. Somebody – maybe it was me that texted in, in – in our slack and, and will was like yep i'm just happy tech beat boston college i hate boston college yep there we go well i just want to mention as well tech women's lacrosse uh tough one last weekend against duke fell eight to nine uh it, that was in blacksburg but beat longwood in the midweek and then on the road at pittsburgh came away with a 13 to 9 win in acc play so I'll, that's i watched that game at the gym on saturday did you yeah there sure you did. go it was on all the they had all the tvs on the acc network so nice. i got to watch it it was back and forth until the end. Until yeah. Away. So it was not, and, and Pitt's not bad. Pitt's not, and nobody in the ACC is bad. A newer program, uh, actually just their second year as a, as a program for Pitt. A couple of big opportunities coming up for Hokies women's lax, though. On the road at Clemson, that's this weekend, and then the next weekend on the road at North Carolina. Those are two beatable teams in the ACC. When you look at the ACC standings, Tech currently six at, sits at sixth out of ten. Carolina is one tick above them. And then uh, Clemson is one in four in conference play. So two winnable games. Tech could get kind of in the mix towards the top half of the ACC at that point. So big couple of weeks coming up for the lacrosse team, Olivia Vergano and company. So definitely follow along. Going to ask you guys this before we let everyone go. We talked about the flip of the script with basketball coming to a close. What's the content plan? What can people be on the lookout for? Transfer portal. Yeah, transfer portal stuff. Uh Whatever happens with whatever, this, Kenny, whatever happens yeah. with Kenny Brooks, um, you know, we'll have some more football access this week. But let's be honest, like even when they give us access, they don't let us see very much. So there's not going to be a lot of like a lot, a lot of hard hitting football information. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk to uh, Kyron Drell and Sam Brownfield this week. OK, least. so some interesting stories can come out of that. And we'll, get, we'll get Pry in for the first time in a couple of weeks. Pro Day's Wednesday. Not really a big crew. Uh, potentially going to the NFL this year. I think Feldarius Payne might be the most interesting story there. 
Uh, I'm not sure. Kind of sort of a late rising guy who only played you know one season at tackle. I think there's a lot of question marks about position wise where he could fit or what his ceiling is coming off that you know significant injury a couple years ago. So uh, you know that's where we're at with football. Yeah, um, very interesting shift of the year for me. Uh, basically, been go 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 since uh, since August, and now basketball ends and it's just like a stop a halt. So, but there will be plenty of transfer portal stuff. Yes. Um, I, I tweeted out late last night some uh, just what the rosters look like for next year, um, and we don't need to dive into them. But but we will, I think, know a lot more about Tech's rosters over the coming weeks for both men's and women's basketball. A lot on the women's side hinges on Kenny Brooks and Kentucky and what happens there. Uh, maybe we'll hear something on the Georgia Amor front. Uh, a lot of kind of just questions, not necessarily good or bad, just kind of questions. We don't know what it looks like for next year. Um, but I did tweet, you know, Hey, here's what the roster currently looks like for next year. If nothing changes. Um, but yeah, I would not be surprised if we hear some, see some attrition, at least on the men's side. Now that the season has come to a close and we have, uh, you know, they've been able to have their exit conversations and everything. And, um, you know, besides that, I mean, kind of just baseball and softball now. Raza Murani and Sam Mostow are going to be extremely busy for us. They already are, but oh, they're yeah. going to be uh, they're going to be carrying a lot of the weight here. Uh, at least, especially once we get past the spring game, and which is just in a couple weeks. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps things up for today's show, episode three fifty six of the Tech Sideline Podcast. For Jack Brizendine, for Andy Bitter, for David Cunningham, Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long from Blacksburg. We'll see you right back here next week.